Thank you very much, Giovanni, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I've been asked to speak about low anterior resection syndrome. Um, I have no disclosures pertinent to this presentation. As I'm visiting uh, Seattle, I thought I'd bring a little Arizona sunshine to you. Um, so, upon conclusion, I'd like you to be able to define the symptoms of low anterior resection syndrome, discuss the path of physiology, be aware of some preoperative considerations, consider measures aimed at prevention and mitigation of symptoms, classify and diagnose low anterior resection syndrome, and manage both minor and major LARS. So, low anterior resection syndrome is clearly the consequence of sphincter sparing surgery. Surgery is the curative form of therapy for rectal cancer, but involves removing the rectum, which is a reservoir, post-operative scarring, possibility of sphincter dilation, preoperative radiation, and post-operative diversion and atrophy. And it presents with a constellation of symptoms, as you see here, incontinence, urgency, frequency, fragmentation and clustering of bowel movements, difficulty with evacuation, excessive gas, and altered stool consistency. And these are some of the risk factors, as I'd mentioned, but neoadjuvant um, chemoradiation uh, is certainly a factor, as is post-op radiation. Chemotherapy, compliant it because of diarrhea, the very low anastomosis, which goes hand in hand with total versus partial mesorectal excision, the temporary diverting stoma, which results in atrophy, uh, any pre-op pelvic floor dysfunction that the, pelvic ha that the patient had, and anastomotic complications. So in terms of pathophysiology, there are several aspects that have been identified, including colonic dysmotility, dysfunction of the new reservoir, and dysfunction of the sphincter. There's a lot of information here about colonic dysmotility, but basically the um, interruption of the colon by removing a segment um, can actually increase motility and decrease colonic transit. Uh, and um, there is subsequently a greater increase in neorectal pressure after a meal. And the patient's physiologic break after a meal has been removed. The rectum is denovated, both from dissection and radiation. And the denovated neorectum is hyposensitive to the normal stimuli. There's reduced capacity. You're bringing down a segment of descending colon that has less, a lesser diameter than the original rectum and different compliance. And therefore, even a smaller fecal load can cause the sense of having to evacuate the neorectum. And that's one of the benefits of creating a, a new reservoir, although that advantage over a straight anastomosis lasts about 18 months before they all become roughly equivalent. Anal sphincter dysfunction may be pre-existing after childbirth in female patients, but is also a consequence of both the operation and radiation. And up to 18% of patients can have sphincter injury. So in terms of making the diagnosis, it's important to have this at the back of your mind and at least suspect this syndrome in patients who have one or more of those bowel symptoms. When those symptoms persist beyond a month after closure of the ileostomy, if the patient has a diverting stoma, then that confirms once you've ruled out other causes. And other causes are things such as this, consequences of anastomotic failure or stricture, ischemic colitis, radiation proctitis, as mentioned, pre-existing sphincter injury, bacterial overgrowth, and exacerbation of pre-existing IBS symptoms. So it's important to consider a full history and physical including very simple digital rectal exam to evaluate the lower anastomosis and endoscopy if necessary to image it. Other forms of imaging, such as CT scan or endoanal ultrasound. Anal manometry is not necessarily necessary for diagnosis, but can be useful to help monitor your therapy. And a patient questionnaire can help in terms of a score for this particular syndrome. This LARS score is a validated questionnaire with just five questions pertaining to flatus, liquid stool, frequency, clustering, and urgency. And it allows classification into either minor LARS or major LARS with the cutoff point being below or above 30. It's widely used, it's concise, and it's easy, as opposed to uh, an alternative 
uh, questionnaire, which was actually the first one developed in 2005, which has some very complex scoring with different subscales and total scales, so it's not as widely used. So treatment of minor LARS, this is a score of less than 30. These patients generally have preserved quality of life overall, and their symptoms are more of an annoyance um, rather than uh, truly affecting overall quality of life. This can usually be medically managed, and a multimodal approach is generally better than any single intervention, but there's very little good data out there. For patients with diarrhea, certainly medications to slow down the diarrhea, such as uh, loperamide, are useful. But again, the data is extrapolated from patients with diarrhea predominant IBS and from patients with ileal pouches. Postprandial urgency or incontinence can actually be helped by a 5-HT3 receptor antagonist, with some of the better data being with ramacitron but there are other medications that have really only been better studied in diarrhea-predominant IBS and less so in LARS. Gas and bloating may be an issue for some patients, and simply uh, some of the over-the-counter preparations of cymethicone can be helpful. But also, this can be a symptom of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and if that's the case, the patient can be tested for that and treated with either rifaximin or neomycin. These are all common approaches that we use for LARS, dietary restriction, fiber to bulk up the stool, or constipating agents, or probiotics. No good data for any of them, but everyone has anecdotal evidence for trying them. They, um, there's little or no harm attached to trying any of them, and generally patients are, are tried on most of these before being considered to fail therapy. A last score of more than 30 is, has been shown to dramatically affect quality of life. And these patients do require multimodal therapy. Possibilities include transanal irrigation, pelvic floor rehabilitation, and what's important is reassessment after a period of therapy. So transanal irrigation is best in patients who have either fecal incontinence or frequency, and it's cheap and it's safe. Low volume irrigations, uh, less than 250 mils, can be useful for patients who have post-evacuation seepage. A larger volume can be helpful um, in stimulating functional colonic mass movements, which help to clean out the colon, much like using irrigation of colostomies. Um, again, very little good data, small study of 14 patients, showed quite remarkable results in a decrease of daily bowel movements from eight to one during the day and from three to zero at night. This, um, if you have a stoma nurse, oftentimes they can help with uh, educating the patients or it's generally very simple. Um, there are commercially available systems that will allow the irrigant to uh, be in the range of 500 to 1500 mils. Simple water is fine. Uh, patients are often hesitant and wonder what liquid they should use, and I often use the analogy of cleaning your teeth. You use water. It's intestinal mucosa. Water's not going to hurt it in these volumes. One of the things that doesn't come out in um, many articles is uh, what should the water temperature be? And if you think about the concept of um, retention enemas versus enemas that are used to expel, a warm liquid will make the bowel relax, um, and is better for retention enema, so a treatment of the mucosal surface, which is not what we're aiming at here. We want to stimulate movement of the colon, and therefore it's better to use cool water or room temperature water. Pelvic floor rehabilitation uh, is referring to a number of modalities, including biofeedback, pelvic floor muscle training, electrostimulation, volumetric or balloon training, and Again, a combination of techniques is better than any single one. Low quality studies, once again, are, are a feature of reviewing the literature for this. The pelvic floor rehabilitation protocols differ across institutions. Different scoring systems are used and different interventions are used with different periods of follow-up. Uh, even uh, uh, an attempt at meta-analysis was foiled because of the heterogeneity of the studies that are available. It's important to evaluate the patient after six to 12 months of management. 
because if they're not improving and their quality of life is still affected, there are other more aggressive interventions that may benefit them. One suggested intervention has been to evaluate for sacral nerve stimulation. This improves both fecal incontinence and the ability to defer defecation. There are multiple theories as to how this works, um, and it currently is thought to uh, influence pelvic afferent or central level nerves. It also impairs postprandial rectal motility, uh, which can be helpful in blunting that gastrocolic reflex. So um, let's move on from that. There have been multiple studies, again, limited by being retrospective, small numbers of patients and heterogeneous, but overall, approximately uh, just over 70% of patients who have placement of the temporary leads will go on to placement of the permanent device. And this does improve both fecal incontinence, the ability to defer defecation, and the problems of fragmentation, urgency, and overall results in improved quality of life. Ultimately, for the patient for whom there's no solution, other means of improving the sphincter muscles, such as gracilloplasty and occipital bowel sphincter, have not been studied in the setting of low anterior resection syndrome. The only remaining option at that point, and generally a patient will tell you when their quality of life is so bad that they wish for a diversion. And that's important to be open to that conversation. So in summary, it's important to be aware that low anterior resection syndrome is common. It's persistent in patients postoperatively. And over a long study period, almost half of the patients with major LARS still have it present many years after their initiating surgery. Active prevention can be useful in terms of counseling the patient preoperatively regarding their risks based on their current risk factors such as radiation or pre-existing sphincter injury. And early pelvic floor exercise postoperatively can also help. Prompt diagnosis is best for the patient in terms of preserving quality of life. And again, a plea for multimodal management. Thank you for your attention.